Okay, so welcome. Uh, so my name is Jeff Mori. I'm from Red Hat. I'm the lead for the product, which is called uh, Red Hat uh, Developer Studio and GBoss Tools. So GBoss Tools is the, is the upstream project, and Red Hat GBoss Developer Studio is uh, the Red Hat product. So we're going to talk about uh, Eclipse uh, Docker tooling and OpenShift tooling. So you're going to have just a, a few a few slides to, to present, and uh, we're going to have a bunch of, uh, uh, of demo. So Docker tooling, uh, it's an Eclipse Foundation uh, project. It's part of the Linux, uh, Linux tools uh, sub-project. Uh, Red Hat has a, a lot of contributors on, on this project. So mainly the, the great, great added value uh, of uh, this product is that you're going to see the Docker assets, images, containers, and so on through an explorer view. And you're going to have some uh, user interface uh, commands, most commands. So you can, you can pull an image, you can tag an image, you can start a container, and so on. Another feature of uh, the Docker tooling is that you have uh, Docker file integration, so you have a specific uh, uh, Eclipse editor uh, for, for the, this kind of file. So you have a, a content assist. It's, it's quite a basic content assist, mainly it's for uh, the keywords of the Docker files. And also, uh, from this Docker file, you can, you can make a build, and the context of the build will be linked to your Eclipse project. So if you have reference to files, it will be uh, relative to, to your project. We have also uh, Docker Compose integration, so you can. Uh, so we we don't have a specific uh, Docker Compose editor. It's based on you have a, in Eclipse you have a, a YAML editor, so you can reuse it. But you have you have nothing specific to the Docker Compose, but it will check the the syntax. Uh, and of of course, uh, same as before, you can launch. So using this uh, Docker Compose, you can launch a, a cluster. And everything is also related to the, uh, to the Eclipse project. OK, so now we're going to switch to the demo part. <coughs> so here I am in, in a developer studio. So I have the Docker Explorer view. And uh, the, the, the first level of the Docker Explorer is the Docker connection. So I am in a, an empty workspace. So I, I need to create a, a Docker connection. So Something it's quite difficult because uh, you have to, to set up the certificates if you are using self self sign. So you have a, a Docker machine integration. So you can search for Docker connection. So it will uh, use a Docker machine for that, and discover that there is a Docker machine which is launched, which is called EclipseCon. So everything will be will be automatically filled, and you just have to to specify. Uh, so the second level, as I told you, it's containers. So I have one, only one containers, and I can see the, the images that are uh, present in my, in my Docker container. So let's uh, start a container. So I, I just need to, to select an image. So sorry, first I can show you that you can also pull an image. And there is also an integration to the, to the Docker registry. So you can set up your own registry. Here we, we're going to. We're going to search on, uh, on uh, Docker Hub, so I want to search for white fly images. OK, so I have all the available. Uh, so I will, I will take the standard white fly images. And you can, uh, you can, you can, you can see the, the different uh, tags for, for those images. And if, if you select and finish, it will put that image. I won't, I won't do it because it, will, it may take a, a long time. So uh, once I have my image, I can, I can start a container. So I can select one. So my image is selected. Uh, I can set up the, the, the port I want to, to publish. Uh, I can link to other containers. So everything that is available through the command line is uh, also. So let's start this, uh, this container. So you, you, you see that in the Explorer, a new container has been created, but in fact, it's not really started because uh, I need to specify a command in order to, to keep it. So normally, if you start a container, it will be uh, with a, a green arrow. 
So here it has been started and auto automatically uh, uh, stopped because no, no, no action uh, has, has been taken. So let's take a, a real image. So I have a white flag image here. <coughs> so if I want, I can specify the, the name of my container for better. And I can also, so I, I want to access my, uh, my white flag server one, once it will be started. So I will set up the, the HTTP port to, to be redirected to my uh, local HTTP port, 8080. And then I can start. So we're going to see the, uh, the traces from, from the container. And if I act So you're going to see that I'm, I'm not going to use localhost because my, uh, my Docker engine is running in, inside the VM. I am on Windows, so we have no sub native support on Windows. So my uh, white flight is now started. From here, I can stop the container in order to free the, the port. And if I don't want to see any again, I can remove it. Okay, so once you remove the container, everything related to the container is removed from, from, from the Docker engine. So you can also tag an image. So let's say I have this, uh, this uh, image. I will add uh, a tag. Let's say uh, my own tag. Oh, sorry. Okay, so uh, I specify a, a full tag, so you're going to see that this image now has two different tags. The first one that existed before, which is a two, and my own tags that I, I, I set up before. Now we're going to see uh, the, um, <coughs> Docker Compose integration. So, so I want to run a cluster. So what I choose is to run a Spark. I don't know if you're familiar with Spark. So Spark, it's a, a runtime, a framework for big data. So basically, it's, it's running as a, you have one master and you have several, several nodes which are called um, the workers. So the workers need, need to connect to the, to the master. So in my Docker compile, I have a first service, which is, which is a master. And then I define two different uh, workers, but they need to, to, in order to connect to the to the master, they need to get the IP address of the of the master container. So, if you look at the definition, yeah, I have a link to master. So now, Okay, so now my cluster is starting. If I go back to the Docker Explorer, you can see that I have now three more uh, containers. And if I go to the same IP address, which is now the uh, web interface for my master, okay, so that I can control the node, I can see that uh, now I have two different, uh, two different workers that, that are connected to, to the master. And if I want to stop my, my whole cluster, uh, I have a, a button in the console window so that all, 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 uh, all the services, so all my containers will be stopped. So if you look at the green arrow, it will, it will uh, disappear. So, okay, now my containers still exist in the Docker demo, but now they are in, in, in a stopped state. And if I want, I can, I can remove them. Now we have the Docker file integration. So as I told you, there is a, a content assist. So if I select a control space, you, you're going to see all the uh, keywords from the Docker file with uh, the explanation. So here, what I'm going to do, I'm going to build a, a Docker image uh, based on a white fly image. The only thing that I, I'm going to do is when you, when, when you, you, go, you got the, the base white fly, 
you have no admin setup. So I want to set up an admin because in the in the in the following demo, I, I, I need to, to connect to that uh, to that Wi-Fi, and I want to deploy an application. So I, I need to, to have the uh, admin access to be enabled. So this is the first part. The second part is that uh, I, I want to also to to debug my, my application inside the container. So I need to, to enable the, the debug uh, the Java debug mode. So this is uh, this flag. So from here, I can run uh, <coughs> my build. So it will uh, first ask me on which uh, Docker connection you want, you, you want to build huh, in order to, to, to address a specific. And let's call him uh, for example, uh, Wildflight 3. Uh, Okay, so everything was in the cache, so it was really fast to, to build that image. And if I look at the uh, Explorer now, you're going to see that my uh, Jeff Murray white flight image now has uh, three different tags. The two that existed before, the three that I just created, and the, the old one. So now we're going to run this uh, Docker image. Uh, so everything is set up correctly. I have the, the port that I export on my machine. So I can start the, this uh, Wildfly server. So let's verify that it's running correctly. Okay, now I, wa I want to check that the admin is uh, available. Yes, it's available. I can access my uh, my uh, remote administration. So it seems my image is, is is now correct. So now I want to 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 be able to first deploy an application on that server, and then uh, test uh, modify, for example, a, a file and see what what's happening and debug that application. So in order to do that, I will uh, create uh, what we call. A, a WTP server adapter, which will be able to, to communicate with that server. So there are many, many different kinds of server adapters. So I will choose Wildfly the 10. So it's not running on uh, localhost, but on this uh, server. And here I will choose manage operation because when you deploy uh, using that uh, kind of server adapter, you have two ways to deploy an application. Either you copy through, through a, a shared folder between your, your workspace and uh, Wildfly, but because I'm, I'm running Docker and my container in a specific image, it would be complex. Uh, even uh, I am running on Windows, it's, uh, it's more complex than if you are in, on, on, li on Linux. So I, I, I may choose a, Management operation, which means everything, every action that you communicate between Eclipse and the uh, white flag will be through uh, a TCP socket. So it's, it's better. And I will say that the server lifecycle is externally managed, which means, okay, my server is already started. So this is not Eclipse that will manage uh, the server lifecycle. Okay, so now I just need to start my server. So because it's externally managed, this is, this is just a, a, a kind of no op operation. And then now I want to deploy my application. So I have two, two, two let's say, G2 application in my, uh, in my workspace. So we have a very simple JAXRX ap application. So I will add it, so which means I will deploy that application to my uh, to my server. So you see, uh, this is a process which is called publishing, which is I will send the the, the file of my application from my Eclipse workspace to my uh, Wi-Fi container inside the Docker Im image. Yeah, I, I can see that my application is deployed. So if I show it in a in a browser, I can access my application. And if I click on uh, XML, I can see the result of, uh, of my, uh, my service. So the last step is that, uh, okay, that's fine. My application is deployed. Now I want to be able to, to debug my application. 
So in order to do that, I will just restart my server in debug mode. Okay, so it will create um, a remote debug connection between Eclipse and the Docker, uh, Docker uh, container. If I go to my uh, application source files, so it's a very simple source file, uh, two different classes, uh, the controller. Okay, so you're gonna see I have a, a, a breakpoint here and a breakpoint here. So let's see in action. Okay, so now I, I, hit, the, I hit the breakpoint, so I have the standard uh, Eclipse wa warning, which tells me, do you want to switch to the debug view? Yes, I want to switch to the debug view. And I can see, for example, there is an instance of Hello Service. I can see all the details. I can step in, step back, everything is. So I have my application, which is deployed inside the container, and, and I can debug, debug uh, from within this, this container. So uh, now we are done with the Eclipse tooling. So let me clean up my workspace. Just to make sure everything is OK. So now uh, we are going to talk about OpenShift. I don't know if you're familiar with OpenShift. So, so far, uh, when you got the Docker runtime, you have everything in order to do, to do some kind of container isolation, communication. But if you want to, to have a, a cloud-based deployment, you, you, you need uh, some, some layer above. So the first layer that you, you need is orchestration scheduling. So this is done by Kubernetes, which is an, uh, an open source project originally pro uh, created by, uh, by Google. Now there are a lot of uh, contributors in that space. So inside Kubernetes, uh, it's basically infrastru infrastructure as a code. So everything that you, you, you're going to deploy through Kubernetes uh, will be managed through uh, what we call resource. So if you want to, uh, to, to launch a container, uh, you will launch what we call a pod. A pod is it's uh, in fact a set of containers that are assigned to one of the uh, of the several nodes that you have in a, in a cluster. And so you, you're going to talk to what we call the Kubernetes API master. So you're going to say, okay, I want to create a pod, and Kubernetes will uh, decide on which node it will deploy that that, uh, that that pod. So a pod may be several containers. So in that case, uh, when you deploy a pod uh, and it has many containers they will be on the same node. But you can decide in your own deployment to have several pods. And in that case, uh, the two different pods may be, uh, uh, may be split on, on different nodes. Op OpenShift is a layer above Kubernetes. So it has a, a specific set of features. So mainly it has some, some kind of built integrations. And it has some what we call the builder images, which, which means that you can build your own image from your, your source code. So let me take an example. Uh, with OpenShift, you can say, OK, I want to take an uh, EAP image. From this EAP image, I will take my, my, my source code of my application. I want to run um, um, a Maven build. As a result, I, I will have a WAR, an EAR, or whatever which will be deployed to the, uh, to the EAP, EAP. And the result will be a new image. So uh, a, new, a new image with EAP and my image. And this is that image that will be deployed on a cluster. OK. The second thing wh which is interesting is that you, you, you have the notion of uh, image stream. So an image stream, basically, it's a capacity from the cluster to detect that uh, a Docker image has changed. So it's very important because this is what we do when we, when we do build. We generate a new Docker image. Now, uh, imagine that your source code has been modified on GitHub or your Git repository. You can decide to manually schedule a new build. So it will generate a new Docker image, which will be pushed to the Docker registry. And automatically, 
uh, OpenShift will detect that he, he, this image has been updated and it will uh, perform what we call the, uh, deployment rollout. So it will uh, shut down the existing pods and create uh, new pods. Okay. And uh, also we have a, a web admin, admin, admin console. So the OpenShift uh, tooling, it's a GBoss tools project. So it's not from, uh, from the Eclipse Foundation. It's done mainly by, uh, by the uh, Red Hat teams. Uh, basically, it's uh, allow you to, uh, to, to, deploy your, to develop your application from within Eclipse and to test it uh, uh, on your OpenShift cluster. And you also have an uh, integration with Docker tooling. So you can, for, for example, you can build your own Docker image that, like I did before. And once your Docker image has been built, you can decide to deploy it on, on your OpenShift cluster. We have a tool which is called Red Hat CDK. So CDK stands for Container Development Toolkit. So basically, uh, I don't know if you're familiar with Kubernetes, but it's uh, sometimes quite difficult to set up. So what they did is that uh, in the Kubernetes world, there is a tool which is called Minikube. So Minikube will allow you to set up a, a, a Kubernetes cluster using a, a single virtual machine. So basically, it will be a, a cluster with a single node. On OpenShift, you have what we call Minishift, which is the upstream project. So you, you will have all the functionalities from, from, uh, open, from OpenShift, but based also based on a single machine. And Red Hat, will uh, will have uh, CDK. So the difference between Minishift and CDK is just that you will you will get what you, you get from the Red Hat ecosystem. So you will get uh, um, what we, uh, standard image, EAP image we, that you, you can't get you can't get from the upstream project. Of course this uh, this um, CDK is available on, on uh, Linux uh, Mac OS and, and, and Windows. And the idea is that you can set up a, a Docker, uh, uh, an OpenShift cluster inside a, a VM and work locally with, uh, with that, uh, OpenShift, with that uh, OpenShift cluster. So basically, uh, the difference between the upstream project and uh, Red Hat CDK is that it's using RHEL as, uh, as the operating system where uh, Minishift is using uh, CentOS. Uh, and uh, we are using uh, OpenShift, uh, what we call OpenShift Container Platform, OCP, which is a Red Hat product. So the main difference is that you, you, you're going to get access to a, a Red Hat uh, Docker registry where you can find all these uh, EAP uh, and so on uh, Docker images. Okay, so it's a little bit uh, the same as, uh, so I will not uh, spawn a deployment because it may, t may take a long time. So I already have one, one deployment available. So I have my, uh, my, doc my uh, OpenShift connection. So basically I have my OpenShift connection from my uh, Eclipse uh, workspace to my uh, local VM. But also if you have, uh, if you, if you have, there is a, a uh, Red Hat offering, which is uh, OpenShift Online, so you can also uh, you can also deploy on, on OpenShift Online if you have uh, an account, or if you have a, an on-premise uh, OpenShift, you can also work the same way as, uh, as I will show you. So the first concept that we have in uh, Kubernetes OpenShift, it's called namespaces or projects. So basically, it's uh, it's, uh, it's a separation uh, between the, the cluster in terms of uh, when you define the resource, you define the resource in a project or in a namespace, and there is an isolation between the namespace. So if you have, a, for example, if you have a pod which is running on a, on a namespace, it, it can't communicate to, to another pod which is uh, on another namespace. So here I have a namespace which is called uh, EAP, and I, I have one, uh, one pod which is running. Okay, so my pod is running. And, uh, but the pod is not accessible from outside. So you, you need a way to access your pod because it's a wild fly, so there is an HTTP port. So I want to, to be able to access that uh, HTTP port. So the first concept is what we call the service in terms of uh, Kubernetes. So basically a service, it's a, a DNS view of one or several pods, okay? 
Here I have a single pod which is running, so a single container. But I can decide to, to scale up or scale down my, my deployment. So I can say, okay, uh, I am, uh, uh, this is a wide fly, so I, I can decide, okay, I, I'm going to have some, some kind of load on, the, on that server. So I can say, okay, a single pod is not enough. I can uh, 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 scale up my, my deployment. So in a, uh, in a way, you need, you need a unique, unique uh, DNS entry in order to access all these, those different pods. So this is what we call a service. So basically, a service, it's a DNS name. So in that case, it's called GBOS UAP7 OpenShift. That will be targeted to a specific um, pods. And how, how the routing is done between the DNS entry and the pod, it's because you can put some labels on your pods. So when you define your deployment, you're going to define the different pods that you're going to deploy. So, for example, we will say, okay, I want to deploy a, a wide fly or EAP pod, okay, and I will put that, uh, that kind of label. So, I can say uh, front end, okay, for, the, for those pods. And I can say, oh, say I, I, I will have some, some other pods which are the back end. And when I define the, the service, I will say, okay, this service. Is, is linked to the pods that are uh, which, uh, which label front end or back end. So each time, some, sometime in the cluster and the namespace, we will use that DNS entry. Uh, it will be communicated with one of those pods. So it's up to you to decide how, how you, you have your own topology inside your, your cluster. But it's not enough because uh, a service is, is just a DNS entry which is only available within the cluster and within the namespace. But you want to access from outside. So you need a, a, a new tool, which is called a root. So a root is linked to a service. And basically, a root is an, an HTTP URL that will be linked to a service. And this HTTP URL, so you don't see, but it's, it's, it's using the nip.io namespace, can be accessed from, from uh, outside the, the cluster. So let's let's try to to see that. So I see I select the route, and I can see my uh, my, uh, my So now I want to do the same that I do I did before for uh, for white flight. So I want to be able. Uh, to uh, update my application, to do some kind of development, and to debug on an OpenShift cluster. So, in order to do that, we will create it. We will create what we call the server adapter. So, if a server adapter it's really a tool that we do some kind of synchronization between the pods which are running inside the, the cluster. And uh, your local your local Eclipse project where you have your source file. So each time you modify a file, uh, uh, then it will be uh, synchronized to the pod, and uh, you, you can see the, the changes. So this is what we're going to say. So here I have to specify one deployment. So in my name in my namespace I have a single deployment. So and I have to specify the Eclipse project where my uh, my application source file are stored. Okay, so when you do that, uh, it, you, will, you will see some, some, some traces because we will synchronize the uh, files from your local Eclipse project to the pod to make sure that what is running in the pod is in, in line with what you got in your uh, Eclipse project. So now if I look at the Eclipse project, so this is this new one. Okay, so I have a, a simple, uh, a simple uh, welcome page. Okay, so I just want to modify a little bit that page. So let's say. Okay, so I save this file, and you go, you you can see here in the trace that the, this file has been sent to the pod. So now, if I come back. to my web browser, I can see the change that has been brought to the, uh, to the, to the cluster. 
So everything I, I modify the file, so it's, it's, it's true for uh, GSP uh, HTML pages. So they will, they will be broadcasted to the, to the pod. But it's also true to, to some code. So if you modify a Java file, of course, we will not send the Java file to the, to the pod. But uh, because Eclipse will have compiled the, the file, the corresponding .class file will be sent to, to, the, to the cluster. And you can see the life changes. Now we're going to get the final stage where we want to debug our application. So same as we did before. So I will restart my server adapter, but in debug mode. OK, so what's it, what it's going to do is it's, it's going to um, respawn the pod. Because in that case, in the white flight case, uh, I have control of my, on, my, uh, on my Docker image. So uh, I set up my Docker image so that the, uh, the uh, debug, debug mode of Java was enabled. But then here, I, I took a, uh, an image which, uh, which was available for the Red Hat registry. So I need to specify. So basically, because it's designed for uh, deployment, uh, you need to specify some kind of environment variables in order to set up the, the, the Java debug. The first thing is the, the, that stuff. And the second thing is that you need to, um, to be able to communicate to the uh, Java um, uh, debug socket. So you need to, because, because everything, uh, all networking functionalities is, is controlled by the, um, by the um, OpenShift cluster, then you, you need to, to use a functionality of OpenShift, which is called port forwarding. So you can, uh, port forwarding, it's a, it's a tool that allows you to, to bind a local port of your machine to a port of on, on your cluster. So basically what we're going to do is we're going to spawn a, uh, a debug configuration in Eclipse, which, is, which will be communicated to a local port on my machine, but this local port will be bound to a port inside the cluster, so that I can do a remote debugging. Uh, so let's have a look at the Java files. So here I have a, a controller which will be called. So I have a method uh, register. So this is a method we will be called when I register a new user. So I set up a, a breakpoint. So now let's try to access our application. Just before, uh, I don't see if you if you see, but the name of the pod. Uh, so basically, it's a, it's a common root. So it's gboss 3 ap 7 openshift and then you 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 have a number. So you you can see that it done, the number has been incremented. So before it was one dash something. Now it's two dash something. So which means uh, the cluster has uh, respawned my pod uh, in in the debug mode. Okay, so now I have reached my breakpoint, and I can uh, see uh, whatever I want. Uh, so I can see my uh, my variables. So it was really light debugging. So what you 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 saw here uh, on uh, it's all everything is running on my uh, my uh, local cluster, but it could be uh, running on a, on a remote cluster on OpenShift Online, for example. You, you will get the same functionality. So basically, in terms of development, you have the same uh, workflow that you have before when you do everything in, in, in a local. That was the end of my demonstration. Uh, any questions? I think we have one minute for questions. Okay, thank you very much. Thanks.